Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to a verbal portion of a drug abuse presentation. I'm Dr. William G. Van Meter from the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology, the College of Veterinary Medicine at Iowa State University. I've come here to ask you a question rather than to tell you some things about drugs. What I'm going to talk about today, drugs, people, and problems. So we'll start off in reverse order and I have a problem. Does anyone here have a solution to the drug problem? I've asked this practically every place I've been, and I've received the same kind or similar kinds of answers. Silence. But people start to think about it then. Another way to get you into action is to ask you, why are you here today? Do you want me to tell you what to think about drugs? Or perhaps do you want to make up your own mind about drugs? and your relationship with them. Another good opening is, good afternoon, fellow household junkies. Do we all have our coffee this morning to wake us up? Do we all light up our cigarette when we were talking on the telephone? Do we have our chemicals that keep us going? What do we have in our medicine cabinets at home that might provide a good starting place for somebody that wants to get on drugs? What would I do if someone very close to me or in my family suddenly had a problem with drugs and I found out about it? What would I do? Think about those things. Because that puts it on a one-to-one -one basis. It's not somebody else, someplace else that's got the problem. And it's not going to be somebody else, someplace else, that's going to have the solution for you. Because we've all got it, we've all got it together. It's nothing new. Drug abuse has been with us for some time. About 4,000 BC is when we started. And we're still going strong today. We compared marijuana and alcohol 2,400 years ago. Herodotus did this, comparing how the Scythians in Asia Minor threw hashish, a form of marijuana, onto the fire, and they got intoxicated. He said, about like the Greeks did with wine. So that's nothing new. So what really is new? Let's find out about the drugs. What kind of drugs are people taking? Well, let's break them into four categories. We can talk about stimulants, depressants, hallucinogens, and a weirdo group, miscellaneous, anything you want to call it. Stimulants. What kind of stimulants do we have? We have stimulants such as cocaine, very potent stimulant drug. We have stimulants such as amphetamines, all kinds of stimulants, the uppers. These are drugs, diet pills. They make you feel good, they make you go, you think better, you feel better, you approach things better. Let's take a typical example, a housewife. Having a little problem with the weight, and having a little problem keeping the house in order, and having kind of the blahs, I think they call it on television for us. So if she takes a diet pill, she takes a diet pill and she starts to lose weight. She feels better. Then she starts to feel better. So she starts taking the diet pill to feel better instead of losing the weight. Consider her plight. She's facing, after a weekend, let's say in the fall, when there's been good football games going all weekend, everybody's been lounging around the house, there's a lot to be cleaned up, the husband's going off to work, got to get the kids to school, got to get the laundry done, get your week lined out, and you're walking on your insteps. Now the alternative is when you take the diet pill. You suddenly feel good. You're up in the morning first thing, you get the, everything taken care of, get the laundry in, get the kids off to school, the husband's gone off to work, and boy, you feel great. By the time he comes home at night, you're ready to go. This is the alternative. The problem is that the drug never really stops. And pretty soon the body's got to fail. It can't take this constant stimulation. Hence, in the jargon of today, speed kills. Speed being an upper or an amphetamine type of compound. You can take it for a while, and this is the basis for its, its therapeutic use. It's okay for a while, but you can't have it as a steady diet. Downers, these are the depressant type of drugs. 
Alcohol, classic example. One of the biggest problems we still have today, the biggest drug problem, is with alcohol. More kids are getting drunk in school, still coming to school drunk, same as it's always been. Accidents on the highway, the whole bit. This is still from alcohol. One of the problems, interestingly, coming up now is people who are on barbiturates, and these are the sleeping pill kind of compounds, these drugs produce an ataxic gait. You stumble around when you walk, and you have problems with motor coordination. You can't quite operate like you should, very much like a drunk. So if the guy's on downers, and he's driving a car, and he gets busted, before he's arrested, he'll take a slug of whiskey. Now, he doesn't have enough alcohol in his system to get prosecuted for that amount. He's not legally drunk. But the combination of the two, the alcohol has covered up the effect of the barbiturates. So there's another problem with alcohol that we haven't even looked at, just as mere presence. So we're not able quite to handle that. And there's a lot of work been done with alcohol, and we still can't 100% cure alcoholics. So that's a difficult situation. That's a downer. Barbiturates, very potent substances. If we take barbiturates long enough, we fail to get the same response from that same dose of barbiturate, and something called tolerance develops. You've got to take more of the drug to get the same effect. And you take more of that, and you've got to have an increasingly large amount. Now, the period of time that you've been taking the drug is a very important factor, because if you stop or you have to abstain from the barbiturate, then you undergo something called withdrawal. And withdrawal with barbiturates is a pretty grim thing. It starts off with kind of a watery sensation in the eyes, an irritability, a lack of sleep, somewhat of a loss of appetite, a trembling sensation, itchy skin, kind of an irritated person. And if it's gone far enough, if you've been taking barbiturates long enough, the central nervous system gets involved to the extent that you have convulsions. The deadly part is that the convulsions may be delayed as much as 12 hours from the last cutoff point of your barbiturates. So you think, wow, I got through it, and there's no problem, and then boom, it hits. And they can last for up to seven days afterwards, on and off. So these are grim. The medical profession had problems because they thought, well, we've got it under control. No problem, just put them in the hospital. All of a sudden, the guy throws into a convulsion, could break a bone. It's a very potentially a, a very dangerous threat because barbiturates keep people from breathing. That's the way they kill. They depress nervous tissue, and eventually you quit breathing, and you die from that purpose. Heroin, morphine, and the narcotics. These are also depressants. Heroin, regardless of what you've heard, withdrawal from heroin is not a real good thing. It's not a simple thing. The people who are saying heroin withdrawal is simple are the ones that haven't gone through it. Take the one who's gone through it, and you're going to find out just how good it is. Symptomatology. Watering in the eyes, teary in the nose, kind of an irritable feeling again. Lack of sleep, loss of appetite. And you put this together, you see, and you got somebody who's really irritable. And you start having gastrointestinal upset, and this continues on. Very strong stomach cramps that you can't believe. Nausea and vomiting. You can have a precipitous fall in blood pressure. Death can occur from heroin withdrawal. Doesn't have to, but it can. Is it a strong impact on the individual? Yes. When they cook a cap of heroin, they usually strike a sulfur match, cook it underneath, and then pull the stuff out to shoot it in the veins. Even years after, if a man is off heroin and he smells that sulfur match, he can break out in a cold sweat, remembering what that withdrawal is like. So it's not a real good thing, you see. If you've got a choice of doing something for the afternoon, don't undergo heroin withdrawal. It's not real good. But this is a kind of a compound which has really got our hooks, its hooks into us today. Because heroin is the big one people seem to go for. They may start off on a, on a lower drug of some kind, but if they're going into the drug scene and going into it heavy, that's the direction they're going to be moving. Regardless of how you feel about it, this is what's going to be happening. Now, I'm not saying that if you, you smoke a joint of marijuana, Tomorrow, you're going to be a heroin addict, zero. However, if you might be on the near west side of Chicago where there's a lot of heroin traffic, an awful lot, and you take a small black child and introduce him at age 9 or 10 to marijuana and into the lifestyle of that ghetto where there's plenty of heroin available, don't bet a lot of money that he won't go on heroin. 
The odds are stacked against him. So it's possible there's many factors involved, not just man's definition of what might happen. So if we're going on to heroin, we've got a problem. We've got heroin in Ames. We've got heroin in almost any community that you want to pick. Don't be surprised if it's there. I'm not saying there are people laying in the streets with needles in their arms, but it's available. How can you get heroin? If I wanted heroin right now, how would I get it? Well, I could go down to Des Moines. I could contact my Episcopal priest down there, who's worked a lot with the drug scene. He could let me know who's using heroin, who's having problems with it. I could go through that individual and find a pusher pretty fast. Because if you want to buy, there's a market there. So how easy is it to get? Very simple. You can even go through your church to get it. So there's no sanctity set up any place that it's, oh, no, that can't happen here. That's somebody else's problem. And forevermore, I'm always hearing, is there a drug problem? No, that's over in Iowa City. You know, Iowa City's got to have the drug problem. Well, if you're in Iowa City, they say it's in Ames. If you're in Ames, they say it's in Eldora. Eldora, they say it's Sioux City or someplace else. Somebody else has always got that drug problem. But it's there. We've got GIs coming back into service. Now, what's the potential threat there? Well, they're getting pure heroin. They're getting at two bucks a day. That's about their fix over there, and that's pure grade stuff. In this country, in Iowa, it's going to cost you about 40 bucks a day for that habit of cut heroin. That means you're going to have to be stealing between $500 to $1,000 worth of merchandise to make that. The Vietnamese, it only cost them 45 cents a day. See, they're making a profit from 45 cents to two bucks on the GI, so there's profit there. The GI is getting it for two bucks instead of 40, so there's profit there. And the guys that are dealing this stuff are making big money. So there's profit there. So everybody's making money, and the guys that get the dope want it, and they want more. Fact one, it's not pleasant, but if somebody is on dope and really likes it, you're not going to get them off of it. You can be nice. You can be involved with them. Everything else, they are not going to go off that dope unless they want to. That's the critical issue. If they want to get off, that decision is made, then they can make it. You better be there to help them. But until they make that decision, it's like that alcoholic. You're never going to make it. The way people get hooked on heroin is they chip on it. They chip around for a couple years. Man, I haven't decided I'm going on heroin yet. But that decision is being made by heroin, not by the individual. Because pretty soon that body's got to take it. And the drug, drug's a chemical structure. It's a stupid thing. It has no brain. It can't say, well, gee, I don't want to addict this guy. It just is going in there based on its chemical structure and going to react. That's all it can do. You can think one way or another about it, but that drug's just going to sit there and look at you. It doesn't know any different. Heroin, that's a big one. And when you take heroin long enough, the first experiences can be unpleasant. You can have nausea, vomiting, but you continue to take it. You seek it out. Past that stage, it gets to be a very pleasurable experience for a brief period of time. Then if you don't get it, it's a very unpleasant experience, so you take it to avoid that experience. So you go from a positive reinforcement in psychological terms of the liking to a negative reinforcement, avoiding the problem. And it's a very powerful problem. Hallucinogens, what's so exciting about them? We're talking about compounds like LSD, mescaline, bufotenine, marijuana, a whole host of others. And marijuana has been classified by some as being a very mild form of the LSD experience, a very mild form. You can explain it about any way you want because most of the psychedelic experiences are somewhat unique for each individual. A lot of commonalities in between, but most of them are very basic. How did all this start? Well. About 1960, we had a man named Tim Leary who wrote a pretty good book about this and how to turn, drop out and tune in and turn on and the whole bit. Told you what to take, how to take it, with whom, what kind of music to play, how much, what should be read to you, what to think, the whole thing. And people gave up all that freedom, boom, that fast. Don't get excited because 100 years ago, about 1850, Thomas De Quincey wrote a nice little book in England called The Confessions of an English Opium Eater that turned a whole generation of people in England onto opium. They did the same thing we did 100 years later. They got all uptight about it, passed a lot of laws because they thought that was pretty bad. Now, we're trying to pass a lot of laws, too, but that's not going to handle it. That's only part of it. Because if you haven't heard, heroin's illegal. So why do we have heroin addicts? So the psychedelic generation starts with Tim Leary. Pretty much becomes very popular. And the thing that's exciting about it, in terms of what's different, is that it's happening to the white, upper, socioeconomic classes. It's not happening to the ghetto area where they're talking about pot, where they're talking about 
heroin, morphine, and this kind of thing. It's happening to the people who have, not the have-nots. So we're confused. We can't say it's a ghetto influence that's causing this. So we have to structure something different. And we don't know what to put there. So we say, let's pass a law and let's go out. And what do we have in the past? Well, we hit the pusher. And we all know what a pusher likes because we've seen them in the movies. You know, a trench coat, sunglasses, they're taking the little girls astray. That's what a pusher looks like. And we constantly say, if we hit the pushers, we've got the problem whipped. Well, who is a pusher today? What's a pusher look like today? Might be the kid that's got the car for the weekend that can get over to Boulder or someplace where he can make a big hit or in the city, make a hit on the drugs and bring them back and sell them. He might have enough money that weekend to get it for his friends. He might be anybody. So if we're going to hit all the pushers, let's get a new jail system, that regional jail system we talked about, get it all together because we're going to have a lot of people in there. The American Bar Association Journal says two approaches to the control of the drug issue. One is law enforcement. Two, education. The first one is not too practical. But we've got to try it. We've got to try and stop the big influx. It did happen one time. We did decrease the, the amount of drugs. This was in World War II. Had a decrease in the number of addicts. Went down precipitously. But it takes World War II to do it, you see. You cut off the supply from the Middle East, from the Far East, and so forth. And you can cut off pretty much the supply of these compounds. It'll be interesting to see now that Turkey has been cut out of this thing, how much of an impact this really will have in the traffic in opium. Okay, opium is grown in Turkey. Black marketed, say about 100 bucks worth, because it takes, a, a Turkish farmer make roughly $1,000 a year raising opium, now the, the poppy seeds. Now this is a very difficult crop to raise. About once every five years, you can get a good crop out of it. It's got to rotate the crops. It takes a lot of rain, very tenuous thing. So he can go and say, well, you know, it didn't work out too good this year. I lost so much. And he can black market, say, 100 bucks. Well, that's 100 dollars out of 1,000. That's better than some of us can do on taxes. So now there's 100 bucks going to Lebanon, where they can very easily pull out the crude morphine from the opium, send that to the north of Greece or the south of France, where they have simple laboratories set up. They can acetylate it and make a pure, very high-grade quality product called heroin. Now, when it came out of, it takes 10 pounds of, of crude opium to make one pound of morphine. So it's 10 bucks a pound. After all this processing, and when it gets into New York, as it hits the harbor, it's $5,000 a pound. Profit? Not enough yet. After it's cut and goes on the street, it's $100,000 a pound. Now, there's markup. There's profit. So that's coming in from that side of the world, and we've got it coming back from Vietnam on the other side of the world. So it's difficult to control this. Now this traffic has been there a long time, and it's going to take something like World War IV to stop it. I'm assuming in Vietnam it can be considered almost World War III on the edge of it someplace. So we've got these kinds of problems facing us with regard to control of traffic. Can't do it. So much for the psychedelics and the downers. How about the miscellaneous group? This is interesting because in this group we're talking about such compounds as milk, shot IV, intravenously, nutmeg, peanut butter oil, mayonnaise, you name it, anything, okay? Now are we going to le legislate and legalize or illegalize milk, peanut butter oil, and a few of the others? We can't do that. So what's our alternative? How about each one of us, not somebody else someplace else, but each one of us taking a little stock of what, what is reasonable in an approach, okay? Drug companies for a number of years would put baby aspirin together in bottles of 50. What's the lethal dose for a child? 50. So what do we do? We take a scientific approach, we cut it down to 49, and give the kid a break. That's essentially what it amounts to. Use reason. If you have drugs in your cabinet that you don't need, get rid of them. Don't, off, don't take away the availability. And we've got something called television, which is constantly barraging us with all kinds. I got a great tip for anybody who happens to be a marriage counselor. Buy a bottle of cyanates. If you've seen that commercial on television, the poor girl goes out, she's got a terrific sinus headache, and the guy didn't propose. She takes a cyanate, and the next picture she's in a wedding gown. Okay, if you're going to be a marriage counselor, all you need is a bottle of cyanates. Start our kids young. Let them know television is entertainment and sales. It's not a medium for therapeutics. We don't treat people with a television set. We entertain them or we sell them something. 
Someday, if you want to have a good time, take a piece of paper, draw a line down the center, put drugs and soap on one side and then on the other. You'll find out you should either be taking a bath, doing the laundry, or taking a drug. Because this is the way most of the commercials are coming across. Recognize it. This is the way it is. And let this happen to the kids, too. Let them realize this is what it is. In their third grade, second grade, fourth grade, medicine, this is given to make you feel better when you don't feel good. Mamas and daddies give you the medicine. Authoritarian approach. Fine at that age. It prevents such things as accidental poisonings. Very important. When they get a little bit older, start explaining in the health and hygiene programs in the schools. Take it as a regular part. Clean fingernails? Fine. How tall did they grow? Fine. What goes into making a healthy body? Fine. What is the therapeutic value of drugs? Fine. What is the, the whole approach to drugs and the individual? Build that in at that level that they will understand. What is addiction? They can learn that early. Sixth grade kids here were asking me, what is addiction? What's it like? I asked them, do your mom and dad smoke cigarettes? Yeah. Have they ever tried to quit? Uh, a thousand times. OK. Addiction is like that, but maybe a hundred times worse. Oh, yeah, they can understand that. Then they've got something to make their comparison. See? And on the same token, if the teachers and if the, the parents can talk with the children, not to them and at them, but with them, then they'll get information transferred back and forth and know what questions the kids have. What is addiction? Why is heroin bad? And have to answer some of these questions, which are pretty tough to answer at the level that the child is asking. Then we go into the high school level, OK? We have a drug program, then. We get a little book out, and we read the book, and we present our program. We have a nice isolated case there, which we can forget about after we do it. And this is what happens. Most of the drug programs die. Unless they become dynamic and become a building part, then we're going to lose it. How do we make them a building part? Well, if you're teaching a section in history, let's take the last century. You're talking about the Civil War. OK, let's talk about the development of morphine as a killer of pain in the surgical tents during the Civil War, OK? And also in the Franco-Prussian Wars, another one. All the European conflicts, where we had the new cannons where we could blow people to pieces, and we had to sew them together in surgical tents and kill pain. Then let's start talking about how morphine created addicts at that time. We can talk about perhaps even read some of the information of Thomas de Quincey in these Confessions of an English Opium Eater. In English, we can look to Kubla Khan at McCulridge, okay? Excellent author, a beautiful, beautiful poem, written during an opium reverie. And later, if you look at the letters he wrote to his brother where he's terrifically concerned because so many of the English and the working classes were using opium. They were neglecting their families as he had neglected his, and it was an accursed habit, his ruination. See how far along, I mean, it's great at one point, but then later on it turns on him because he doesn't know. Discuss this whole thing, so you built it into the English area. You want to talk about economics? Discuss the legal as well as the Ill illegal drug traffic. How does the money go into this? How many compounds go through a testing laboratory before you finally get one that hits? When it hits, what does it mean? How, is, how have drugs been affecting our society? Then you've got a sociological thing. And you can do this in the high school. I'm talking about political science. We've got a great issue going on right now with Turkey. We got them to stop making the opium on that basis because we can substitute another drug, Demerol. And you've got something occurring in a classroom which is called relevance because it happens today and it means something to the people. What can we do individually? We can encourage teachers to develop this kind of a program where they add into their own areas of expertise those elements which relate to a common sense approach to drugs. Then you've got something which is going to be with you forever. It's going to be something which is going to be reasonable and acceptable. You can discuss that issue with the man who's, or the woman who is teaching the course, whom you already know from previous discussions. So there's a positive attack that can work. And we're doing that. We can support our law enforcement agencies. This has been one of the areas where I've had the most encouragement. One of the first things I heard, one asked me here on our local police force, what do you do if somebody's high on drugs or having a bad trip? So well, you prevent them from hurting themselves. Just like an individual in an automobile accident, if he's got a busted leg, you don't say, ha ha, it was your fault. I mean, you try and help him. Okay, he said, you're not really telling me anything I don't know. 
The only place I've got right now to take them is over to Nevada to a padded cell, and I don't want to do that. I want to help them. Bingo. What's this? This is a member of the establishment that's supposed to be so anti-help everybody and punish everybody. What's he doing? He's not following the role. Then I started finding other people in the law enforcement agencies that were not only doing that, but others that wanted to be in that, that same attitude of helping. They want to change their image. Let them. And it's a big thing. Now, as a result of that, we have excellent cooperation with our own university health center over here and the police force through an organization on campus through the counseling service. An organization which allows an individual, perhaps gets very high and in, in trouble on drugs, he can get into a treatment facility at the university level or at the local level in the city, where he really hospital without any problem. And this is cooperation through our physicians at our health center, as well as cooperation through the law enforcement agency, as well as cooperation through the individuals who are involved in the community drug problems. The individuals on drugs themselves are having difficulty with them. So there's a communication there of people coming up. Why do they go on drugs in the first place? Well, pick a reason and they'll try it. If you look back through over, say, the last two years, start finding out motivational reasons why people take drugs. And it's an interesting study in itself because it changes dramatically. At first it was who am I, where am I, and all of this. But going back one step before that, it was because of the ghetto area. Life was so bad they had to take drugs. Then pretty soon we couldn't use that excuse because it was something else. So we said, who am I, where am I, and so forth. And then it went from that to mayonnaise, you know, and the peanut butter oil and everything else. So what are we trying to find out as a deeper meaning? And then somebody said, maybe they're just taking them for kicks. Oh, yeah, that could be a reason, too. So pretty soon we have a stockpiling of reasons why people take drugs. There are a myriad of reasons. In many instances, they're taken out of ignorance. They really don't understand what is going on. It's going to be someone else that's going to get hooked. It's going to be someone else that's going to have a drug problem. It's not going to be me. I'm never going to be the one that goes on to something harder if I want to stop on something lesser. It's always going to happen to someone else, and this is a prevalent attitude. Who's contributed to this problem? Well, I listened to one of the drug conferences at the state level at the Armory, Veterans, Aud Veterans Auditorium, rather, and what I heard there was, if you haven't taken 40 amphetamines this year, you haven't done your job, because the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association and the drug industry has put out all these drugs, and they're just, we just have to take them. This was a physician who was telling us this. Well, that's partly true. But documented in pharmacological reviews in 1967 by Ian Oswald, who has done more work with regard to the narcotics and sleep-producing drugs than anyone I know of. He's an expert in this area. He's an Englishman. He has studied the effect of these, and he pointed out something from the public health services. Matters of fact, from 59 to 65, the number of prescriptions for barbiturates in this country increased 535% above all other prescriptions. These are legal ones written. Amphetamines went up 18% above all others. And this happened in Czechoslovakia, Australia, throughout many parts of the world. This is fact, written down, documented, okay? So what do we do, blame the physicians? Partly. How about the pharmacists? They fill them, and they're legally liable, whether there's a therapeutic or a chemical incompatibility there, they're legally liable. So we hit them, partly. The manufacturers are making the stuff, yeah, partly. How about you and I, huh? When's the last time you had a prescription and given to you and said, what is this? What's it for? What should happen to me when I take it? What kind of a drug is it? What should I do with the rest of them that are left over? And make no mistake about it, you keep what's left over because it costs too much money. And you keep it in the medicine cabinet. So who's to blame for this? Well, everybody's got a part in the cycle. And the biggest thing going against us right now is apathy. Apathy is a big kicker. How many people attend the Ames Community Council on Drugs? One in the, in the room here. Very few people will do that. I have missed the last three or four meetings because I've been out talking on those evenings to people trying to get them generated and interested in sending someone into the Ames Community Council so they can find out what's going on in the community and have a structural setup to operate 
within which to operate. Okay? Apathy is a very strong thing. How many, we had a heck of a time trying to get a slate of officers to even run or to sit in and, and, and take on this responsibility. We had to look, a nominating committee was set up and it went on and on and finally found somebody willing to do it. That's apathy within our community. And any time you watch on television or any place else and you don't like what you see with regard to a drug program, come on up with an alternative. Don't expect somebody else to do it. You can do it yourself. You can do that. You can ask things of the teachers in the schools. You can talk to children. You can have an interest. You can have a political interest asking at the state level what's going on. As a district coordinator in the state, requested by the governor of Iowa that I serve in this capacity, very glad to do it. This morning, I received the first information. This looks like a good bit of information from the governor's drug authority. I was asked to serve on this last December. This is the kind of apathy which breaks things down when we don't have something moving and going. We've got to get in make our contributions, do what we can, ask the reasonable questions. The problems today, the problems today are myriad. One of the difficulties is we're presenting everyone, all of us are being able to look at the problems, and we're realizing that as one of the problems, we don't have solutions. So we have something called frustration. We're presenting our youngsters with a lot of the problems of the world, and it can be anything, a war in Vietnam, on through. We're saying, we haven't got a good solution for it. They'll say, gee, this is, uh, you're giving us this kind of a load, but you're not giving us anything to work with. The old methods of approach aren't working, and they're criticizing this. And it hurts us because, in a lot of cases, it's justifiable. What we haven't done is got it all together yet and started working together. I talked to some of the teachers at Ames High School. Many of them are doing a fine job. Some of the, comp the complaints I heard there, as well as some of the high schools in Des Moines, is, gee, I'd like to talk to the kids, but they know more about it than I do. Or they know as much about it as I do. As an educator, one of the things we have to work with is differing levels of information. The instructor knows one level of information, the students know a lower level. You're trying to bring that up together someplace so you can have communication on a parallel plane. Okay, it's great when the kids know that much about it because you can start exchanging information in an exciting environment called the classroom. You can do it on a communication basis. So what can we do individually? We can say, it's okay, teachers, do that. We'll support you if you want to try these kinds of things in a class. If you want to talk about drugs in a classroom and they know as much about it as you do, fine. Find out. And the best way to find out about drugs and what's going on is to ask somebody. Ask a child, ask somebody, and you'll find out. Now, I could wind up by saying you do one, two, three, four, and five, and you've got the drug problem whipped, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to lay out a little challenge for you and say, what can you do as one, two, three, four, and five that would not only increase your knowledge, but increase your effectiveness as a member of a community dealing with a problem involved in drugs. Because we're talking about people, and people have got a lot of problems. Take a youngster growing up today, they've got problems about their advanced education, or whatever level of education they're involved in. What's going to be their lifestyle? They've got to worry about a draft, perhaps. They've got to worry about whether or not they're going to get married. They've got a problem they're involved with what are they going to decide about drugs. They've got a problem to decide about where they're going to live. They've got all kinds of problems centered around an individual. One of them happens to be drugs. So maybe those experts on those children, the parents, the people who know them well, can start pulling together the resources that they've used on any problems and see what they can find out to help them through another aspect of the problems an individual happens, which has, which happens to be drugs in this case. Okay, I fulminated at you now for a period of about 35 minutes or so. So I'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. I can't guarantee you I'll give you the right answers or any answers. But maybe your question will stimulate a question or an answer from someone else. Again, I'm open. If anyone has a solution to the drug problem, please let me know. 
So any questions or answers? Yes. Now the question was, how can the Ames Community Council on Drugs publicize to let the public know that they are open to everyone? Yes, the general public is invited at any time it wishes to attend these meetings. They were announced in the Ames paper, and I think this is one issue that, uh, particularly later this summer and early in the fall, that this could be raised up, that there would be more of an advance notice, say a week's advance notice is the time. Right, I think this would be good, and certainly participation when they do come. Would you agree to say something advertising in the paper, newspaper, advance notice? Would this be sufficient, or you think it's perhaps going radio? Or we can put it over to WOI if they would be willing to announce this in advance of the meetings. This would be very good. I'm sure it's widely listened to, and we can do that. They've been meeting in two places. Uh, originally, they were meeting down at the Central Junior uh, High School because uh, John Madden was the chairman of the organization at that time. Bob Fulwider is now the chairman of the organization, and so they're meeting out here at the university. I don't know where the, their specific meeting place will be. As I said I've missed the last three or four meetings. Right, they are supposed to be. They are charged to be there each time so they can go back to their organization, but everyone is welcome, certainly. And they, they try to have weekly programs to the extent that, for example, uh, they'll have a group of people uh, up from Des Moines or someplace who will present some information. Somebody, for example, one time I was in a, a meeting for the National Coordinating Council on Drug Abuse Education Information in Chicago. I came back and reported on that meeting, and we had some discussions on that basis. New projects, new ideas for drug programs are developed. These are aired through there. And it's a community forum type thing. It's kind of like the old townhouse meetings. It used to be years and years and years ago. Of course, I wouldn't remember that, but that's. The question regards the, the heroin addiction in the service, the vast numbers, and the hope for helping them. Well, heroin, treatment of heroin addiction is a very, well, difficult problem at the present time. For example, if we look at Lexington, there's about 95% failure, 3 to 5% success in treatment through the Lexington facility. This may have gone up somewhat. If we look at the methadone treatment program, which is substituting methadone for heroin, and methadone was developed in World War II as a substitute for morphine by the Germans because they couldn't get morphine during the war. It's a painkiller, but it doesn't have all of the same drawbacks that heroin has. For example, the man on heroin is on the nod. Uh, as they say, and he's kind of imperturbable, and you can wake him up a little bit, but he's back again, very unproductive. A man on methadone maintenance may be alert enough and can participate in society, so he's reclaimed to a certain extent. But even with methadone, you figure 50 percent success. Then if we start talking in the area of rehabilitation now, you see, we're talking about something else. Now, if we're talking about setting up a rehabilitation center, and you're working with methadone treatment program, you've got a 50 percent success, but you also have a 50 percent heroin market because there's going to be 50 percent aren't going to make it and that's going to be a place to sell heroin. So communities may want to set up a methadone treatment program without taking the other into consideration, which creates additional problems. The chances for success are not good. I don't know whether there'll be thousands or not. There are going to be a large number of people coming back with heroin addiction. We've had this before in our country. We had the morphine addiction problem after the Civil War, which interestingly enough we call it the Army disease which is a bit different than the army disease of today, but we have heroin today, so I guess this is sufficient. So it's going to be a difficult problem. They're trying things. The army started off first by saying, well, five, four or five hospitals set up across the country. Now, you don't hear anything more about those four or five hospitals. You're hearing, you know, in vastly increased numbers of hospitals. We're going to have to build these hospitals and take care of these problems. Because if a GI is coming back and he does have a heroin problem, we can't punish him, throw him in jail. We've got to try and salvage this individual, certainly. Uh, the idea is therapy, not punishment. And if he's doing that, and if he needs the drug and has to have the drug, and it's on an illicit market, that means he's going to have to steal or rob or something to get it, which is going to be an increase in crime, and for a pr practical reason, if nothing else, there's an increase in tax dollars to try and control that crime rate. In New York City alone, where the, perhaps the greatest heroin problem is, they figure 80% of the crimes of property are committed by addicts. 
So, I mean, that's a big factor. I was recently talking to someone coming through from the East Coast, from Ithaca, and he said he felt there was about a 50% chance his home would be broken into. And this has happened within the last three or four years as a result of an outgrowth of this kind of theft and so forth going on. No, it's not hopeless. It's a grim problem. But we've got the best thing going for us, which is our own initiative, our own ability to solve these problems, you see. We've, we've had something snuck in on us, and we've not responded to it. And as long as apathy sits there, it's going to continue to get worse. But once this breaks down, let's oversimplify and divide everybody into three groups, okay, with the drug scene. We've got this rehabilitation. Rehabilitation programs are necessary, they're vital. But consider rehabilitation, what it requires. It requires somebody on drugs to begin with. So you're starting off in a pathological approach to a solution to the drug problem. You've got to get somebody on drugs to rehabilitate them, you see. That's the way a re rehabilitation program works. But it's important. I mean, we've got people on drugs, so we have to work in that area. Then we've got a middle group here of people on drugs who like them, who want to stay with them, who don't want to do anything else but drugs. And there's no way we're going to get into that group, no way we can measure that group. We can't say how many people are on drugs. Because it's an illegal traffic, we just can't measure it. We can measure the rehabilitation. We have 10 people, we save three, that's good. You know, we, we know that. But the area, other area, we don't. And the first area, which is total madness, is it's completely ridiculous in the area I'm working in, which is in prevention. So how, you can't measure it, you can't do anything about it, except you just try. You put forth the best information you've got, because you'll never really know when somebody has decided not to use drugs. And one of the drug problems, as I see it, in the state of Iowa is putting information about drugs into people's heads, giving them opportunities, so that when the opportunity comes up for them to make a choice about drugs, they'll have something to make it with, instead of just who wants to tell me. Last year on this campus, we didn't have any kind of an information source. We went over to the library and charged, challenged them with a question. If somebody on this campus wants to know something about drugs, where do they go? They went to the first person to tell them anything. So we tried to put together, and we did. We had together an information center on drugs. We had lots of kinds of information. What was interesting there, some of the heads wouldn't, uh, the drug users would not give us their information because they were afraid it would be stolen out of the library. So it's a difficult situation. You know. But you try. So this information, because if we get to the other point where we're saying, you don't do this, suppose we are wrong. Suppose we find out that marijuana really isn't too bad. And it, well, suppose we even find out it's a good substitute for alcohol and gets people off of alcohol, see? Then all of a sudden, we've got to look back and say, well, wow, all that stuff we said about marijuana was bad. I'm not saying it does, far, and nobody has any that kind of information. But I'm saying we have to use these things with a common sense approach. What do we know? No, this is what we'd like to know, but what do we know? And we've got an election year coming up, too. So let's ask some of our politicians, what are they going to do about the drug scene? We heard in the last one that we had one of the best drug programs in the country right here in Iowa. So we start asking our politicians, you know, what is it? New York State is spending, what, $60 million a year? We're trying to get 40000 in action here. It's a different kind of drug problem, but it's still a problem. But that's why I'm saying don't expect help from the state level. Don't expect it from the federal level. Take it from the local level, from the very close local level, the individuals. Attending meetings such as this, discussing it, seeking alternatives talking to young people, creating lifestyles that are desirable for people. This is a very solid alternative. Yes? Right. The question was regarding how did the British system work out? Well, the British system, several years back, Britain had about 300 addicts. And everybody's saying, wow, how does Britain do it? It's kind of the envy of the rest of the world. So they legalized and they put drugs out in the hands of every physician. And they went from about 300 to 3,000 addicts in a very brief period of time. And this was due to ignorance on the part of the physicians. They did not realize how much drug it took to maintain an addict. And the best thing an addict can do, as he feels, is to let somebody else turn on with him. I mean, that's, he's sharing that. And that's a real good party. So they started turning other people on to the drugs because they were getting more than they needed. So the British system said, wait a minute, something's wrong. It's not working like we thought it should because we're getting more instead of less. So it's created a problem. So they went back and said, OK, let's see who is qualified to deal with the drug situation, such as clinics, psychiatrists who have dealt with drug problems, et cetera, examples like this. They curtailed it back to this kind of a qualification approach based on expertise in these areas. 
the level of addicts, number of them stabilized off and started decreasing. And the British system, if you compare it very carefully, is not too unlike the system that we have today in the United States. It was that grand experiment that went kaploy. Wait a minute, the bottom of the vessel was open, you know, and everything poured out on the floor. But that was the British system that worked at that time. Looks like you have a question. What is it? Okay, the question was, on the Iowa State campus, where can somebody go if he has a drug problem? What can they do for him? We have a counseling service over here, an excellent person by the name of Ron Baker, another excellent man by the name of Marty Bielefeld. Both of these people can begin. It's an initiating point. If you're out someplace in the middle of the night and you have a drug problem, something comes up, you can call a number called Open Line, 232-1650. Everybody should remember that number. Now, this Open Line provides a service where somebody will be on the other end to answer to begin with. It'll be just an individual trained, like anybody we could take out of this audience, take them in there, period of training, they would be there to answer in, in a qualified way. Not just, I'm in here today, I think I'll answer the phone, but they have gone through a period of training. Now, if there's more than they can handle, there's a peer group of individuals who are drug users, or have been, and they understand what the drug scene is about. And if the individual is uptight and has a real problem with the drugs, they can send this individual out because he will understand. If the guy's going through a bad trip, he'll know what a bad trip is and can help him. He can, in a sense, babysit with him with an area of knowledge because he has been in that area. Okay? If it's more than he can handle, there are the professional counselors, such as Baker, such as Bielefeld. They can get to them. And if it's more than they can handle, they can, there are several physicians. And as of January last year, when it was some of the physicians names really got concerned because the kids were not coming to them with drug problems, we have some available now on an anonymous basis through Open Life. They can come if life, and if the guy's overdosed in some way, his life is threatened, he can get there. Now, if it's a continuing problem, the first place to start is at the counseling service. In other words, it's not just a crisis intervention type thing, but this guy's got a drug problem that keeps coming up all the time, he wants to get on the drugs or he's been hooked on something, how can he go? They can counsel you, get you into the right avenues. That's the place to start, and from there it filters out and goes to the appropriate places. Yes, question? Is the service being used by the youth of this college to a large extent? Yes. You mean in actual figures and numbers? I'm not a, uh, I do not have those actual figures at, at the hand to give you. I can tell you this. It's a service which is available. It's a service which is, has been used. And we have saved some like three or four lives this year as a result of this service. Now, on a continuing basis, it's very difficult to get anybody in there for service. I mean, if to get somebody to recognize they've got a drug problem or any kind of a problem at all, to get them over there. Let's say it's not even a drug problem. To get them over to the counseling service, it's not an easy thing. This is a problem that's, that's universal at all campuses. But it is a service which is available. Many campuses do not have this kind of a service available. And it doesn't work. Yes? Now, this is, um, let me break your question down and rephrase it a little bit, and I can give you a yes and a no answer, okay? That's a good way of ducking out. Yes, many of these drugs can produce genetic aberrations. If they are taken during, in large enough doses during the first trimester of pregnancy, most drugs can produce a change and are a threat to anyone expecting a child if taken during that first trimester of pregnancy. This is why it has to be guarded carefully. Many drugs will pass right across the placental barrier. For example, the effect on a heroin addict, maternal heroin addict, the child is born as an addict. The first thing you must uh, do is undergo withdrawal. The only thing the kid did was, I mean, he was born and taken away from his supply, so now he has to undergo withdrawal. So these things can pass across the placental barrier if it, they're at that vital time where there's a great deal of formation going on in that, that developing individual. Yes, there can be damage at that point. For example, of the drugs I've mentioned today, some of the downers, thalidomide is one of the downers. And recently on the coast, they were going up on speed, or going up on acid, and coming down with thalidomide. Even recently. See? So it doesn't matter whether we know this, that it's going to be damaging. There are other factors involved. So any of these drugs, even uh, there's some experiments with rats and guinea pigs and a host of animals, where they injected extracts of cannabis or marijuana into expectant mice and, and different animals. And it produced aberrations in the young if they were injected during that first period of pregnancy. But this is like any other drug, so you have to be careful at that period of time. 
non-pregnancy. Uh, many compounds will break down chromosomes. Aspirin, I think, is one that's been recently pointed out. Any, any compound will really do this. Now, there's a recent issue of Science, which is a, a scientific journal, uh, and where they had made a survey, a good summarization of the information on uh, chromosomal damage and some of the and LSD, I believe, was a compound, a specific compound that they referred to at that time. And this is something that's like almost of the same ilk as, uh, well, you say not to smoke pot, but you drink alcohol, you know. And they say, well, you say not to use LSD because it causes chromosomal damage, and yet it doesn't do it. And it's kind of a, you know, so what? I mean, there's enough other problems with something, with some of these drugs, without even thinking about chromosomal damage. I mean, somebody who's undergoing withdrawal from barbiturates doesn't need to worry about chromosomal damage. <laughs> He's got other problems to handle. So, I mean, there's a variety of things. But the common sense approach, which is at that first, you know, that period of pregnancy, watch it and check through the physician so he can carefully control it. Physician in those instances happens to be a qualified source person. And this is what you want to look. What's the guy's qualifications? Why should I sit here and listen to him? There are other questions. Yeah. I did too. The question was, uh, to, or the statement was that to point out that counseling at the university here is a free service. I assumed everyone knew that, but uh, evidently they don't. <laughs> It is. It's a free service. Yes. Right. It's a prof straight professional approach. These are private records. And they are there really to help. This is the main reason. Yes. What alternative do you have? If, if the physician chooses not to tell you what the drug is, if he tells you it's good medicine, <laughs> uh, say, okay, let's start again. And ask him again. And never underestimate persistence. It's a great thing. Keep asking him. And pretty soon you're going to be taking up too much of his time and he's got too many other patients sitting out there and he's going to have to say something. But basically they will tell you. you know. If you ask me, for example, you know, what are you knocking me out with? <laughs> they may not like it that way, but I'm sure you know, if you ask them what it is and what, what should be happening. It is a little check for them, too. Yes? Uh, on the label. Right. Right. Tranquilizers, I suppose these are abused as much as any other drug. Uh, I just tried to hit the high points as far as drugs. The question was why I hadn't mentioned tranquilizers in this category. Tranquilizers, uh, very interesting, they're prescribed more than any other compound, a uh, great deal. If you look at Smith, Klein, and French laboratories, they have two enormous buildings there. One is the, the house Benzedrine built, the other one's the house Thorazine built. One's a tranquilizer and one's an amphetamine type compound, which gives you an idea of the power of drugs, because drugs are very powerful substances. Um, tranquilizers can be used and abused, certainly, to a certain extent, but these do not have quite the effect, let's say, that uh, a barbiturate does, so they're not really the drug of choice. There is one exception to that called fencyclidine, which is a kind of tranquilizer kind of a, for uh, experimental animals used in monkeys, rhesus monkey, which is a very vicious type of monkey, very aggressive type of monkey. Uh, it calms them down. It's really an anesthetic type compound. I was fortunate enough to be one of the first ones to work on this in this country, and uh, Park Davis had the drug. And it was excellent. It was tried to, they were going to use it for birth, parturition, because it took the mother down to a safe level in humans and brought her out real fine except she hallucinated for about three or four days afterwards. You know, and this was a bad side effect, so I said we can't use it that way. But it's excellent for taming wild animals and handling them. You, know, you, you shoot them with a pellet or something and it gets them down, then you can handle them that way, and they come out of it very nicely. But tranquilizers, by and large, are not as much a choice. In some localities, yeah, you'll find it. Now, the talk recently has been in the coast, you know, on the West Coast, tranquilizing, tranquilizer use and the use of um, of uh, psychedelic drugs is really going down. Marijuana is still very prevalent on the West Coast. A friend of mine who's a priest out of the Berkeley was saying that, yeah, these are pretty far down, but what's coming in very strong is a hardcore narcotics. And I mean, it's a fact. The government's finding it. You say, why can't we bust the people that are de dealing them? Ask the United States government, the Army. They've had a problem going for a long time and they're just now becoming aware of it. It's not that easy. Yes, another question. As a pharmacologist, not as a pharmacologist, I can, 
but I am not in the area of retail. See, that's a pharmacist. And as a pharmacist, yeah, a pharmacist will be able to exert this kind of thing. The public can't at large. Right. Not true. No, the pharmacologist would not have more sway, unfortunately. The person, the, the people who have the greatest sway is John Q. Public. He's got the most power. You send those letters, very simple way to stop pushing, stop use of drugs, you know, abusing drugs. Just don't buy them. Very simple way. So the pressure does, I mean, if you're doing that, you're saying it's all in one little bag. As far as the American Association of Experimental Pharmacologists, this is not, they're not in the retail business at all. This is not their area. There are some, like myself and others, who are working to try and explain the actions of drugs and are conducting uh, information area type things and suggesting avenues as to acting as steering committees within communities. But these are pretty well limited. You see, you have to be at a, like a college of veterinary medicine, a college of human medicine, uh, pharmacy school. And these are about the only place you're going to find pharmacologists. Whereas pharmacists are widely distributed throughout the country and, other, uh, and elsewhere. They have, can have more of an impact. Perhaps the best association would be, say, in, in Chicago, where you've got five medical colleges and perhaps more pharmacologists there with the drug companies and so forth. Now, within the drug companies, they can exercise a certain amount of restraint and a certain amount of logic. But then you get into the manufacture of drugs, and it soon gets away from the experimentalist and gets into the hands of the businessman, gets in the hands of the, the uh, lawyer, the attorney, the patent attorneys, and so forth. And you're talking about business trends, you're talking about profit, et cetera, and you get into other areas. Now, an organization that might be able to exert some influence is the organization of the American Medical Association and Physicians. Working in industry, drug abuse in industry is a key issue today. There's much can be done there. And you can approach these people by saying, okay, you can save a million bucks in absenteeism alone if you do start doing something about the drug issue. You don't go in and say you're going to serve humanity. You go in with this other approach, and then you start getting action. And this is what Dr. Ryan from the Sun Oil Company, this is what Dr. Dan Friedman from the University of Chicago, who conducted several, they published a book, several seminars on drug abuse in industry. There is power, there is money, there will be action. And it doesn't have to be the drug industry, it can be other industries. Yes? Wow. <laughs> I have no company other than Iowa State University, and we have not done any research in this area. However, this is remarkable. If it's in 30 minutes, I, you know, it's fine if we can do it. More 30 seconds. Yeah. I suppose at the time that it occurs, you know, this could be. Now, this is another, since we're taking pot shots at everybody, let's take a little pot shot at the religious aspect. Because many of the people that I've talked with that have been into the drug scene heavily, common comment is, yeah, but man, that just wasn't enough for me. I needed something more. And many of them go into some kind of a religious experience afterwards, whether it's Oriental or whether it's uh, uh, Christian, Judeo, whatever it might be. Now, they go into this afterwards, and they tend to move from being a, a very communal type into more of an individual with a great deal more peace of mind, a great deal more strength. And he tends to help other people a lot more. Just as an observation, nothing to support this in, st in statistical verification, but these are observations I've been making. Now, the question I'm asking is, why did they have to go through that first? Why couldn't we communicate this before they went into it? And they're finding that many of the, say, the Oriental type uh, Indian uh, um, mystics, some of them are putting down the use of drugs to get there. They say, you know, there's another way. And once people, if people are seeking and taking drugs for that reason, then they soon find this and go another way. But this Jesus movement, I am not, the Jesus freak type thing, I'm not familiar. 30 second cure is fantastic. I guess at the instant you decide not to use drugs, you know, that's a 30 second cure. Well, it's without, withdrawal. without withdrawal symptoms, fantastic. Because we've had physiological evidence from animals, you know, that there are things which are happening. Of course, we can control some of these things which happen too. Yeah, I would say, <laughs> no, no argument. I would say it's a modern-day miracle, right? Well, another modern-day miracle, you ask about tranquilizers. The average stay for a mental patient in a hospital prior to the advent of the tranquilizers was approximately 17 to 30 years. 
after the tranquilizers was less than one year. Now think of that. If you want to know whether research pays off, think of that in tax dollars if we had to hospitalize those people to date. Think of the lives reclaimed. So let's whip that problem of the drug abuse so we can take the, uh, the advantages of therapeutic and wise use of drugs. Yes? That's a nice unloaded question. What dangers, if any, do I see in the use of marijuana? I guess I want to know. Okay. Let's handle the one on legalization. I always like, somebody has not asked, but we'll usually do that. Well, currently I'm not in favor of the legalization of marijuana because I'm sure the tobacco industry would find some way of putting the surplus tobacco in marijuana and marketing it, and tobacco isn't good for you. So on this basis, I would be against it. Right now, we simply don't know that much about it. We're starting to find out a few things. We're starting to investigate it. Back in 1955, when I began in this business of research, I was working at the Thudicum Psychiatric Research Laboratory in Galesburg. I was very fortunate at that time. I was working with a man named Harold Himwich, who's the father of neurochemistry in this country. And at that time is, is when the tranquilizing drugs broke on the market. We thought at that time we had a good chemical solution to problems. Um, as a result, to test this in our test system, we would go out and get psychedelic drugs of every possible kind we could get a hold of, inject these into animals, recording brain waves, a variety of other parameters, then test other drugs to see if we counteract these effects. We had all kinds of tranquilizing, all kinds of uh, psychedelic agents, all kinds of hallucinogens. Uh, they, we would say, okay, this is a chemical structure of one, let's modify it and see what kind of, kind of a change it makes. Uh, we were able to synthesize and make our own. We had at that time marijuana. We tried it and it just did so very little that it was not of interest. This was in 55. We published all this information. It's available in, in the uh, AMA archives in neurology and psychiatry. It's available in, bi in uh, biological psychiatry, volumes three and four. A whole host of areas where this is available. Okay. In 1960 is when Tim Leary came out with his book. So I asked Alan Cohen, and when he hit on the scene, Alan Cohen was one of his students. He said, why? This information was available, and he graduated uh, summa cum laude. He's not a dingling. He really has got the, his onions put together. I said, you know, why? When all this was around, he said, man, we didn't care. We were going out on psychological field trips that were really grand, and we weren't about to ask. But now Alan's got a little different approach to these things. He believes in, in alternatives to drug use. Marijuana, Weil, a man by the name of Weil, is published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1970, an August issue, an article entitled Marijuana which points out a lot of the history about it, a lot of the chemical structure about it, a lot of the side effects occurring in animals, many of the side effects and in, in the reports in sociological, economic involvement in human beings, the legal status of it, and uh, a pretty much complete issue on that. In a later issue in Science, he publishes adverse, uh, article, uh, adverse reactions to marijuana. We simply don't know at this point. Academically, I'm interested because we've got a drug here now that we can look at before we throw it on the market. And it's been estimated that the average period of time after a drug's been tested, the average period of time after it's on the market, that we know all the side effects is going to be 15 to 20 years. See? So now we've got a chance to look at it. Interesting observation. Marijuana is in short supply, supposedly, in Ames. It's difficult to get a marijuana, supposedly, in Ames. And they're concerned because with this lack of marijuana, some of the heads have passed on to me, that too many people are using cocaine. So it's interesting, just as an observation, that if marijuana is in short supply, why are they going to cocaine? 